Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our 36th session. Uh, we'll be discussing history and insights to surgery with Dr. Lin. Next slide. And our upcoming session. So next week, we'll be discussing legalities in medicine with attorney Jack Ayers. Uh, the following week will be specialty spotlight on cardiology. The next we will be going over forensic medicine. And the next week, we'll be going over PA spotlight in critical care. And she'll also be giving a little information on personal finances. Reagan, may I interrupt? Uh uh, especially want to encourage everyone for the February 23rd session. Um, Dr. Hale is one of our toxicologist emergency physicians here at UT Southwestern. Uh, she spends half her time as an emergency doc toxicologist, and she spends half her time testifying about cases uh, in court around the country of forensic pathology and forensic toxicology. You're going to find that absolutely fascinating. And the legalities in medicine next week with uh, Jack Ayers is going to be phenomenal. Jack is my age, which means old, which means he has had a long career watching physicians get sued, watching the legalities of medicine and so forth. And so you're going to find that very exciting. And finally, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards here, but the cardiology talk with Dr. Nesbitt is going to be wonderful. Dr. Nesbitt works directly with the admissions committee here at UT Southwestern, very focused on diversity in medicine, and that is going to be a terrific talk. So tell your friends. Reagan? Thank you so much, Dr. Feller. Uh, this is our working group. So it's composed of me, Shayon, Taylor, Elena, Rachel, Ani, Miriam, Rohit, and then our four physician coordinators, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Morchetti, Dr. Salzar, and Dr. Reno. Next slide, perfect. And then during the session, we'll have two Q&A portions. And so during those times, if you have any questions for Dr. Lin, feel free to put them in there and we will present those to him during those designated times. And then we will be sure to share the quiz information at the very end of the session that will be posted to our website, our Instagram, and we will send those out in our weekly emails. So hold all your questions until the very end and I'm pretty sure they will be answered. Reagan, let me interrupt one more time, only to say that we wanna welcome everybody tonight. This, this, the 36th session, we can't believe we've been on so long, we've got over 60 hours of shadowing online for you, prepared for you as you prepare your healthcare career. As of this afternoon, we've had over 43,000 clicks onto our website of people um, in uh, 951 universities in 28 countries. So um, clearly shadowing can happen virtually and we are here because you're here. So we wanna thank you for coming. And tonight we have an absolutely wonderful talk by a wonderful man. So uh, Reagan, please take it away. Perfect. Next slide, Rachel. All right, and our speaker has shared his contact information. So feel free to jot this down. He would love to hear from you. And our speaker is Dr. Lin and I'm gonna let him take it away. Yes, okay. Perfect. So uh, thank you, Reagan, and thank you, Dr. Fowler, for uh, having invited me. Um, and hopefully I won't let you down from that very nice introduction. Um, just a few opening remarks before we get started. Um, the contact information, uh, is that the slide before, Reagan? Yeah, it is. Yeah, can we go back to that? Sure. If you don't mind. So uh, Reagan cautioned me that I shouldn't be so generous, <laughs> but uh, I, I am not generous, but I'm passionate about mentoring. And so assuming that after this, you all feel like you'd like to talk to me about anything, if you will, confidentially, obviously there's my email and there's my phone number and whatever medium that you like, you can old fashioned call me, you can text me, you can email me and I will get back to you. Um, and if Reagan's right and 900 people bombard me, which I doubt will be the case, uh, I'll worry about that then. But seriously, do not feel like I, this is up there, but it's not meant to be utilized it is so okay so i've said that so next slide please 
Richard, you should see all the thank yous that are coming through the chat right now by the dozens. You'd be very heartwarmed to see that. Okay, well, I'll take your word for it. So I just want to frame the whole night about where I think this whole presentation is coming from. First, I would be remiss if I did not really and truly thank Reagan, who helped me uh, think about it, helped me when I presented what I thought I wanted to do, gave me her critiques now based on all of what you've told, what I've heard with all these presentations. Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of experience with a lot of other excellent, excellent people, I'm sure, who have spoken before me. But Reagan really uh, was a great uh, assistant, uh, not assistant's the wrong word, that's the meaning, partner, if you will, to uh, make this happen and put the slides together and take my slides and make them more 2021. And uh, so I'm indebted to you, Reagan, for your help. Um, so the purpose of this talk for me is, it, it, number one, it's not about me, even though it says my 37 year career, it's not about me, it's about you all. And I have to say, going back to when I was your age, finishing college, if you will, or even a entering medical student, I did not have this available to me. Nobody in my family were physicians. Nobody went to college. Um, so I kind of winged it, if you will. I hope it's turned out okay. I, I'm, I'm fairly proud and pleased with where I'm at at this point in my life. But this is not about me. It's about conveying to you all what a career, a career, which is part of the, the fourth word there, uh, what a career in medicine is about. Not necessarily surgery, although that's my vocation, but a career in being a doctor and being a physician and what's entailed with that and what, at least in my personal views, which is because I have the platform this evening, what I feel is important to be able to constantly keep on your antenna as you go through decades and decades of experiences, high points, low points, successes, failures, turmoil, whatever, to be able to one day reach where I am and where Dr. Fowler will soon to be uh, at a golden age, if you will, where thank God we have our faculties and can reflect on a whole career, which we could not have done when we were your age. So, so without any further ado, I'm going to take you through this initial uh, experience, which says, quote, my 37 year career in surgical practice. Uh, let me make it clear from the beginning just a little background about myself. Um, <clears throat> I grew up in New York, grew up in Long Island, New York, from a very, I won't say poor, but lower middle class family. Uh, I went to New York University undergraduate school, lived at home, commuted via the bus and subway to the city every day. Uh, was fortunate enough to be able to be accepted to Cornell University Medical College, which is now known as Wild Cornell Medicine. Um, had an incredible, incredible four years there. Incredible, that's all I can say. Um, went on to begin my surgical training. I, I knew I wanted to be a surgeon. Uh, at Harvard at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston under the director, uh, direction of Dr. William Silen, who you'll hear about, and then continued my training back in New York at Columbia Roosevelt Hospital. Um, and then 
for reasons which if, to this day, if I sat on a psychiatrist couch, I would still have to decide why I came to West Palm Beach, Florida, if you will, uh, in private practice, but we'll talk about that. But now that I'm here, I don't have any regrets. So next slide, please. So before we begin on my journey, I think this will be the frame of the whole talk for the next hour and a half, two hours. And I'd just like to read it to you all, even though you can read it yourself. It's entitled Attitude and Charles Swindoll, for those of you who may not know who he is, was an evangelical Christian pastor. And he wrote this, quote, the longer I live, and this is me speaking now, even though he wrote this, because I relate to it. And 50 years from now, hopefully you all will relate to this. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. It's more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It's more important than appearances, giftedness, or skill. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day of our lives regarding the attitude we embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is attitude. I'm convinced, and I'm saying that today, February 2nd, 2021, that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. So put that aside, come back to it maybe later. It's there for you to peruse, but I think it really summarizes what in my mind, your life is about to be about. And it's not over a year or two years or four years in medical school. It's over a lifetime in a career. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so when I said my 37 year career in surgery, so it didn't end the day I finished medical school and it didn't end the day I finished my training. It actually just began. And so when I think of all the things that happened over nearly 40 years, and again, I obviously this is a this is with a surgery uh, bent to it. And for those of you in medical school, some of this may not necessarily be uh, familiar to you all. But uh, number one, staplers. So you might say, well, what's a, a milestone? Because for hundreds of years prior to the late 60s, early 70s, whatever was ever sewn was literally sewn with your two hands and suture and a needle holder and suture. And then suddenly this whole revolution came about mechanical stapling to replace sewing things with your hands. And having trained during the period where staplers were no, were not yet available, this suddenly was <laughs> anxiety producing to say the least, because I didn't know about it, nor had I any experience on it. And yet this seemed to be taking over the way anastomosis, meaning putting things together, was going to happen. So, okay, I mastered that. 
as did all of my colleagues my age. And then suddenly in the late, in around 1990, now I'm in practice 14 years, I've probably done well over a thousand cholecystectomies, meaning removal of the gallbladder, which is kind of the bread and butter of general surgery. And suddenly overnight from a small community hospital in Tennessee came a video about taking the gallbladder out through the belly button with three other little probes, if you will. And this suddenly overnight became the new gold standard. Well, <laughs> number one, it wasn't just a matter of adapting what I had already done for 14 years and adding a little nuance to it. It was absolutely as far and as if being coming from Mars, from anything I had ever seen, heard of, read, or experienced. So here I am now, 14 years into practice, um, mid 40s, and overnight, patients want to have their gallbladder removed this way. Um, <laughs> to make a long story very short, uh, the way it was uh, unleashed to the surgical world was not the way it should have been and certainly not the way it is today. It was basically mini courses over two days on a weekend and then some didactics by the people that were the pioneers of this. If you were lucky enough to get into one of the courses and then doing one of these on a pig, on an animal pig, and then there you go. Um, not exactly the way it, science should have been, but that's the way it was. So you can imagine, again, having done well over a thousand of these of all types, now suddenly doing my very first one. Okay. Well, if that wasn't bad enough to add to my uh, anxiety, I, I'm, I had the privilege of doing I'm a trained vascular surgeon, but I'm also before that a trained general surgeon. And I had made a decision from the get go that I was going to continue to do both vascular and general surgery because I liked both of them, even though I could have done either one of them solely. But I made a commitment to the fact that I was going to do each of them as if they were the only ones I did and was going to be state-of-the-art and on top of my game as opposed to doing one but paying the bills by doing the other. So suddenly around 1999, maybe 2000, the FDA releases the first endovascular aortic stent graft to repair aneurysms, which for over a hundred years were done through a major abdominal incision, sewing in a graft, resecting the aneurysm, big, huge operation of which I had done hundreds. And without bragging, was very, very good at it. Suddenly, this is now being done through a percutaneous puncture in the groin and putting wires up and catheters up and doing it all through inside the arteries. And the patient's going home in a day or two. <laughs> if you would have told me this, when I finished my training, I would have thought you were on LSD. But I went, and now I'm in solo practice 
Okay, so I'm not at the university where I had the advantage of having now younger colleagues who are well trained in this kind of teach me how to do it. I had to take time off, travel all over the country to learn this, which I'm proud to say I did. And then finally, if that wasn't enough, suddenly robotics came aboard in around 2004 and five. And although I did not know that I was going to retire when I did in 2013, I realized very early on that I needed to learn this platform because this was going to become a major force in surgery. And so I learned that. So although there are many milestones, I think these were the four, if you will, and we'll build on that. So next slide, please. So Don Harold, who, as you can see, was from the late 19th century and passed away in 1966, was an American humorist, writer, and illustrator. And he said, the brighter you are, the more you have to learn. So what does that really mean? We're all bright. Every single one of you on this call tonight is bright. Every single one of you has a high IQ, has done well in school, is a proven learner. So the brighter you are, the more you have to learn. So what I added to that from what he said was it's a double-edged sword. It's intellectually stimulating, yes, to continually learn new things and to be able to um, apply these, but the ang it's anxiety provoking because here you are when you're just feeling comfortable where you could do certain things almost blindfolded, if you will, suddenly having to do your very first one in the mid forties or fifties when somebody 30 years of age can do it better than you without the judgment necessarily. So it was anxiety provoking to say the least, as I told you, but it was always challenging and gratifying. Next slide, please. Reagan, can I get rid of the, the pictures on the side so my screen is more full? Let me see. Yeah, okay, great. Can you all still hear me? Yep, yes, we're good. Uh -huh. Okay, so when I said earlier that it's about lifelong learning, again, when you're 20 or 21, it's hard to think what you're gonna be doing when you're 72 or 73 or 67. But your career that you've chosen to embark on that most many of you are waiting with bated breath to find out your acceptance, which I'm sure you're all going to get. It's a never ending lifelong learning pathway. So in 1976, when I started private practice, this is the way the operating room theater looked. And for those of you who have been in the operating room, traditionally, this is the way it is. The surgeon, the assistant, the anesthesiologist, the scrub tech, and all the instruments to do an open operation. And that's the way it was. But when I finished, suddenly with robotics, you weren't even standing next to the patient. You were sitting next to a console and doing the operation with your head glued into that box, which was where the camera was that you controlled and the robot. So just to make it clear, the robot doesn't do the operation. You do the operation. The robot carries out what you want it to do. The robot through your commands, through your little wrist motions, was doing the operation and you're not even at the operating table and you're not even dressed in an operating gown. Who would have ever thought that back in 1976? 
Next slide, please. Or to continue further from the vascular surgical world of mine, when I started practice, this is how you fixed an aneurysm. It was a big incision through the abdomen from the xiphoid to the pubis. You exposed the aorta. You isolated everything. You opened the, the aneurysm, which is a big blistering, if you will, of the aorta. Einstein died from a ruptured aneurysm. George Patton, General Patton died from a ruptured aneurysm. Any event, you then sewed in the graft. And from those of you from Texas, particularly in Houston, Dr. DeBakey and Dr. Cooley, you know, were the giants, if you will. And you sewed in the graft and the patient spent a few days in the ICU. And maybe after a week or 10 days, if fortunately without any complications, went home only to recover. Fast forward to when I finished, as I told you, in the endovascular world, it was all done through a puncture in the groin. Everything done, set up through the arteries, the iliac arteries, the graft put in through a catheter, deflated, positioned, and two band-aids in the groin. The patient sitting up at night, having a regular diet and discharge the next day. <laughs> Who would have ever thought? Next slide, please. So the difference when my teachers, my mentors, my people that I was uh, tutored and influenced to become a surgeon finished and their career as opposed to mine. So they finished their training around 1940 eight, give or take a year or two or three. And maybe they continued to practice for another 30, 40 years and finished around 1980. But as I told you before, uh, it's a dual-edged sword. So in my naive mind, they were very lucky because nothing really changed from the standpoint of technology. So the way they did a an anastomosis of two ends of the colon in 1948 was exactly the way they did it in 1980. They didn't have to worry about staplers. And the way they took a gallbladder out in 1948 was exactly the way they did it in 1980 because there was no laparoscopic surgery. And the way they did an aneurysm in 1948, even though that wasn't done till the early 50s, was the way it was when they finished because endovascular didn't start till 2000. So I'm not saying they didn't learn anything, but from a technical standpoint, they didn't have to wake up at night and worry about doing their very first appendectomy laparoscopically when they were 50 plus years of age. Because the major advances during their time were in antibiotics, intensive care units, preoperative and postoperative care, and anesthesia, but not technological. Richard, it's interesting about Albert Einstein's story in 1955 when he had his leaking aortic aneurysm, abdominal aneurysm. The surgery was new. He was nearly 77. He was very much at the end of his career working on physics, and he just decided not to have the surgery done. I always thought that was interesting. Yeah. Uh, in fact, interestingly, the chief of surgery, when I started medical school in 1967, Frank Glenn, was called because he was in New Jersey at Princeton to see him. And um, but as you said, uh, Dr. Fowler, he declined having surgery and uh, probably made the right choice. Um, OK, next slide, please. So. I told you earlier on when I framed it about mentoring. And I hope that you all, sounds to me like you do, certainly the people on the team have already been lucky enough to have what I've had 
meaning a mentor with Dr. Fowler. But in my case, I mean this with every bone in my body. I believe everything that's happened to me, at least in the surgical world, is because I owe it all to my mentor, William Silen. He was the Johnson & Johnson Professor of Surgery at Harvard Medical School and Chairman of the Department of Surgery at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. He came to Harvard from University of California, San Francisco in 1967 and revolutionized the world of surgery there. Um, the book that's there, Cope's Early Diagnosis of the Acute Abdomen, and I'm sure Dr. Fowler read this book when he was- Hey, hey Richard, I've got it right here for you. Here's the third edition from 1928. <laughs> okay, is, is that, that right? Okay. Yeah, can you see it? No, I can't, but that's oh, okay. Don't worry, but I, I've got a copy from 1928. It's pretty good, pretty, one in pretty good shape. Uh, okay. so, Cope's book was so important. Let, let's talk about Cope. Yeah, well, we're gonna talk about it right now. So for those of you students, and I don't know how many of you have shadowed where you go following doctors, but a long time ago, before, believe it or not, there were CAT scans and MRIs and ultrasound or whatever, you had to make a diagnosis based on taking a history, doing a physical examination, which many of you may think is you know, ridiculous today. And then there were some very, very primitive and limited laboratory data and very, very primitive radiographical uh, um, procedures. And that was it. So Dr. Cope, who was from England in 1921 felt then he was very distressed, Sir Zachary Cope, that people were dying unnecessarily because of either two things. Number one, failure to diagnose, which in the world of medical litigation today and malpractice suits is still probably the number one cause of malpractice, failure to diagnose, or inappropriate uh, treatment. So he wrote a book entitled the early diagnosis of the acute abdomen. So what's the acute abdomen? And again, I'm, I'm assuming of the hundreds of you all that are hopefully still interested in this talk, most of you are pre-med or about to enter medical school. I guess that's where you all are or early on in medical school. Any event, what's an acute abdomen? An acute abdomen means that when a patient comes to the emergency room, to Dr. Fowler, if that patient is deemed to have an acute abdomen, what that means is, and certainly what it meant then, is I don't know what the patient has, but what he or she has is so devastating intra-abdominally that that patient is gonna die if he or she does not get operated upon. And therefore that patient needs to be taken immediately to the operating room, period. That's what that meant in 1921. And believe it or not, it still means that today. It doesn't matter what it's going on in there. That's not the job. The job is that whatever it is, you'll get in there and you'll fix it if you can. But without it, that patient's going to die. Richard, it's interesting about the book because, <clears throat> as you know, we have all kinds of two-day courses like advanced cardiac life support. <clears throat> um, uh, Cope saw that there were people <clears throat> that were dying of abdominal conditions that were not being Correct. diagnosed. And so what he did in creating this book as a great English uh, academic surgeon was to create 
a quick read on how to be at the bedside and determine if someone needed to go to the operating room, Cope said something very important. He said, never complete your differential diagnosis before, uh, excuse me, he said, always complete your differential diagnosis before you even rise from bed, the bed, meaning he would sit on the bed to examine the patient, mm -hmm. which means examine the patient, complete your differential diagnosis, and, and then determine what to do. Yeah. And, and by the way, what was also equally as important was to make sure that you to make sure that you didn't take someone to the operating room who didn't need to be operated upon because it was a problem that didn't need surgery. And the great diagnosticians, and that was a surgical decision that was made by the surgeon. And he had to come in and it was he then, now you all had to come in and it wasn't over the phone. And it wasn't, oh, let me know what the CAT scan shows before you, I come in. You had to come in and you had to make that decision. Any event, this went on until 1974 when Dr. Cope died. And it was probably in his 20th edition that he kept redoing. And he advanced it over the years by as progress came in diagnostic modalities. The only physician to date that ever that was ever to be an editor of Cope's Early Diagnosis of Acute Abdomen was my mentor, Dr. Silen. And the family, Cope's family, knew of Dr. Silen and knew that he and only he would continue to exemplify those principles. Richard, let me see if I understand what you just said. So Cope, who said back in 1921, a hundred years ago, that the difference between a specialist and a generalist was in the rigor of the application of a different differential diagnosis, which touched medical training all over the world. Mm -hmm. He called on Silen and Silen called on you. Is that correct? <laughs> well, he called his family called on Silen. I don't know if Dr. Silen called on me when I was there because um, we used to duke it out a little bit. But um, I'd like to think, and by the way, Dr. Silen will be 90, let's see, he was born in 1927. So he will be um, 94 years old this September 13th. And the sad thing is, the sad thing is that a man who is a giant academically, scientifically, but most important of all, clinically, is now has advanced dementia. And if I called him, he wouldn't know who I am. And it breaks my heart because we were very close for many, many years after I left there. This is so such a wonderful this is such a wonderful talk, Richard. I mean, that you would share this with us. The, and and the, the deep connection that you have to the history of medicine about excellence in clinical practice is humbling for all of us. So, Well, doc, doc, Dr. Silen, doc, I obviously didn't know Dr. Cope. I read the book when I was in medical school. And we'll talk about this later, but I will just fast forward to after I retired in 2013 clinically, I then became an associate professor of surgery at a new medical school in Miami, Florida International University. And I was charged with uh, the third year surgical clerkship. And I will tell you that I brought this book back into the um, curriculum. And I will say that some of the millennial students, and I'll leave it at that, thought that I was old fashioned and a curmudgeon because what do we have to know about this or maybe that because all we need is a CAT scan or an MRI. But I insisted on it and it's part of the curriculum there. But uh, any of it, so next slide, please. So that's who he is. And I'm sitting in my office here and have 
probably three or four pictures throughout my bookshelves of him. Um, you know, Richard, the book lives on, you know, I have several old editions. The one I'm holding here is a third edition from 1928. Wow. But the later editions that Dr. Silen did are wonderful because they bring in, Kat, you know, Cope's original diagnostic skill of talking to the patient and examining the patient at the bedside, and then later to add ultrasound and CAT scans to that diagnostic process were just remarkable, I thought. And you know, um, I'm gonna call you Ray, yes? Please. Uh, okay, I'm sure as an emergency room physician, because I was chief of surgery and would get called sometimes by the emergency department, how this, how upsetting it is when you, here you are, board certified emergency room physician, felt that you needed a surgeon to come in. And again, you're at a university, so it's a little different. But in private practice, it was who was on call. And nobody on call wanted to be on call, but that was the rules of the hospital. And here you are, you already assessed the patient. And you're a board certified emergency room physician. So it's not like you were a retired optometrist, ophthalmologist, when I started doing practice, who, you know, was just there moonlighting, if you will, you knew what was going on. And when you said, I need you, and he or she would say, uh, what's the CAT scan show? And if the CAT scan was normal, he didn't want to come in. Um, so I could go on and on and on. And I'm sure you could tell a few stories about that. Any of it. Well, you know, back in the early, when I was training in the early 70s, a surgeon who did not take out about 10% normal appendices Correct. was not operating often enough. Correct. Today, if you take out an appendix that's normal, you get, you get on the QA committee. <laughs> yeah, well, you're right. And of course, that's because everybody gets a CAT scan. And, uh, you know, so it's good and bad, if you will. Um, does everybody need a CAT scan? Probably not. I mean, there are plenty of patients who present with a classic acute appendicitis, no different than 1921, that could be taken to the operating room. But if you did- Lynn, this is Gil Salazar. I, I'm gonna, just to give our students perspective, the ability for a physician to recognize and diagnose an acute abdomen is one of those fundamental skills that it's absolutely timeless. Um, and if you can't diagnose an acute abdomen with anything other than your eyes and your ears and, and your hands, I would say you got a lot more training to do. So I'm right there with you. And I hope our young students recognize that some of these fundamental skills are never going to go away and you got to master them. Well, you know, Gil and uh, Richard, you know, uh, when I have the residents there, especially the interns, and I say, tell me the difference between voluntary guarding and involuntary. Uh -huh guarding and what what is guarding and it's funny how much is not known today Richard about bedside assessment uh, you know this could be a separate talk but um, as those of you who are about to enter medical school and as I learned when I now became a faculty member in 2013 14 15 and saw the way um the OSCEs, which were these tests, if you will, given the students to show their skills in physical diagnosis. And they went through this checklist of basically, you know, did you percuss? Yes. And they check off the box. Did you palpate? Yes. Check off the, I mean, they couldn't diagnose anything by those because they weren't felt to be important to these students. And I hope and pray, and I, I am confident from hearing Dr. Salazar and you, Ray, that the students that are gonna have the advantage of having you all will be grilled in the fundamentals that we're talking about tonight, because um, I don't wanna get off track too much because otherwise we'll be here till midnight. But when I was, um, Back when I then transitioned to full-time academics, I took 16 first-year medical students to a third-world uh, 
town in northern Peru, Trujillo, Peru, which is a nine hour bus ride from Lima. And we spent two weeks there. And there were no CAT scans there and no MRIs there. And suddenly you needed to make a diagnosis the way Dr. Cope did, the way Dr. Siren did. And so for them to think, well, I don't need all this, you never know. And in, to, even in 2005 in New Orleans, when Hurricane Katrina came, and for 10 days, LSU and Tulane and Charity Hospital were wiped out. There was no power. There were no CAT scans, and yet people got bowel obstructions, people got perforated viscuses, people got appendicitis, and all sorts of things, and you had to make a diagnosis based on skills that, unfortunately, a lot of the newer generation think are old-fashioned and not necessary. So, yes, I'm old-fashioned, and I don't apologize for that, and I'm refreshed and validated by having two other old-fashioned people, Ray and Dr. Salazar. Um, so thank you. That's right. Well, the, yeah, two qu quick thoughts. Um, one is that I distinctly am impressed, Richard, having been in a medical school for 20 years now with all these young kids still coming up, you know, kids that are so smart. They have such great knowledge, but they don't have the clinical experience at the bedside. And so I can go to them and I say that from an apprenticeship standpoint, let's go in the room and if I'm allowed one question for a patient who's having abdominal pain and I can ask them one question, I get them to lie perfectly still. And I say, if you're perfectly still, are you having pain mm -hmm. at rest? And the, if the answer is yes, that's worrisome. The other thing is, uh, uh, Richard, we just got a compliment. You and I and Gil have just been called a goat, which is the greatest of all time. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was Tom Brady. <laughs> Well, okay, well, <laughs> well, we'll find out about Sunday. But... Well, thank you. Okay, keep okay. going. Well, first of all, I, I, I just want to say, I did not know the format of this all that well, but I am very appreciative of your um, chiming in, both of you. And I mean that sincerely, and please don't stop. Okay, next, next slide, please. So... Dr. S this was an article in the Boston Globe written at the time of when he stepped down from surgery in the mid 90s. And it's hard to read, but it exemplifies what he stood for. And I have to tell you just a few vignettes about him. When I got there, and I, I came from a pretty classical training at Cornell University Medical College. Um, it was, for those of you, William Halstead, who's the father of American surgery today and the residency program with Hopkins, uh, his, one of his residents was the former chief of surgery at Cornell in the 30s and 40s. And it was that kind of traditional Halsteadian uh, classical surgery. And these were great surgeons, both the full-time people on the Fifth Avenue surgeons that came. So, I mean, I, I saw a lot of this. And yet I come up there to Boston. And it was like, and I, I went there because of Dr. Silent, because I heard about him, but I had no idea what I was encountering. Number one, when you were on his service, you had to get there at the hospital at 3 o'clock in the morning to make rounds, to get ready, because believe it or not, here was the Johnson & Johnson professor of surgery at Harvard. He arrived at 5 a.m. in the morning. So you made rounds with him and then had breakfast and then went to the operating room. And the reason he was there at 5 a.m. in the morning was that he had so many obligations as a chairman and the faculty member in Harvard Medical School that in order to be able to literally sit at the patient's bedside on the bed and talk to him and examine him and have that much time, as opposed to just coming by and saying, you know, how's everything, boys? That's what he did. And again, and you'll see some slides coming up. 
So when I was there, I'm ashamed to say, I thought he was nuts. I mean, he carried on about minutiae, about detail, about things which I saw these great surgeons in New York at New York Hospital, which is the second oldest hospital in America. Nobody carried on like this. So unfortunately, even though, thank God, I learned what he taught, I, 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 as you'll see from some slides coming up, I didn't appreciate his greatness until after I left. Next slide, please. So Dr. Silent had a million quotations, but three of them were, quote, there is no such thing as minor surgery, comma, only minor surgeons. So just reflect on that, okay? And basically what he meant by that is what may be minor to you, a little boil, a little abscess, a little a hernia, even though you are a chief resident or a fellow and you want to do a big pancreatic resection or take out a lung or do whatever, to that patient, he or she doesn't care how well you do those major operations. He only cares about the little lump on his back, as we'll get to later. Second, there are no mysteries in medicine, only mysterious doctors. So what did he mean by that? Sometimes things don't go well, patient passes away, and people say, God, I don't know what happened. It was a mystery. Well, believe it or not, it wasn't a mystery. It was right there in front of your eyes. You just didn't see it. And then finally, even though many people think, oh, surgeons just like to cut and operate and not think, he felt that surgeons should be internists that operate. And I can tell you, he was on the editorial board of the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the preeminent <clears throat> medical non-surgical journal. He was president of the American Gastroenterological Association, which is medical gastroenterologist. And he was president of that. Next slide, please. Uh, Richard, uh, did Dr. Silen come up with that quote, surgeons should be internists who operate? Was that a quote from him? Yes, sir. Because I, uh, Dr. Arlie Mansberger, who was my chief on surgery oh, sure. in the early 70s, do you know Arlie? I knew he was a great him. man. I did, re uh, I, I did research for him for a year on, uh, on opsonin. And uh, so, but he used to say that, that surgeons should be internists who operate. But it's interesting to know that it came from the guy that trained you. Ray, I'm going to ask you a favor. If you could talk for the next 30 seconds. Um, I need yeah, please. To, okay. I need to take a little. Uh, yeah, do that. Okay. Break. So uh, Gil and Brandon, please join. Um, ladies and gentlemen, what you've heard tonight is something that's absolutely nothing but astonishing. This, this is wonderful information. In medicine, being connected to history is an, is an indeed honor. I, I hope that my picture is showing. Here's a copy of the book that he's talking about from 1928. When Dr. Cope wrote this, what he was trying to do was send a message to the world about how to examine the patients at the bedside. It was not common knowledge at that time. With, and the book covered the world. It went to dozens of editions because physicians needed to hear about how to examine patients at the bedside. What Dr. Lynn has been telling us tonight is absolutely remarkable. And what you've been able to hear tonight is to be connected directly to the history of medicine going back a century. What an astonishing uh, session this is. Gil, can you come in and Brandon? Yeah, for sure. I, I can't reiterate, Ray, that uh, when, you, when you are training for medicine and you have the opportunity to work with folks who have been around the block for a while and you learn the way medicine uh, was designed to be from the get-go, you get humbled quickly and you learn just how special being around those individuals were. You know, Dr. Lynn was mentioning, for example, Dr. DeBakey and Dr. Cooley. I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Red Duke in person oh, as a wow. medical student. So talk about 
learning from, from true giants in, in the specialty. So for our students, every time you get an opportunity now and later on in your training and you get trained with giants, you'll never forget it. And those skills you learn are going to come so invaluable and you're going to remember just how fundamental medicine uh, can be. So this is a phenomenal opportunity for you guys. Well, uh, I'm back and, and kudos to both of you because it's obvious that Reagan and all of her peers that have formed this group were influenced by you all. And uh, so God bless you. Uh, so uh, advancing as we go. So three things I wish I had realized, meaning when I was your age, and I'm talking to all the students on the, on the, on the meeting. Youth is wasted on youth. When you are amongst the forest, you can't see over the trees. And the older you get, the smarter your parents and teachers become. So as a case in point, when I was there and I would you know, go out into the hall with my fellow intern who knew nothing and I knew nothing, and yet here we were criticizing him. Okay, instead of, and if we were in the hall, just kind of BSing while he was going on and on at the bedside, and suddenly he would yell out, Lynn, the pearls are in here. <laughs> Meaning the wisdom was with him at the bedside, not out there BSing with your friends. And So, you know, what can I tell you? But lifelong learning and uh, I guess at some point, as long as we're lucky enough to be able to realize what we were exposed to, it would be great to be able to get it right from the get go, but that's kind of true of parenting and marriage and everything else in life. Next case, uh, next case. That was his own famous saying, next case. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, Richard, lean your laptop screen a little more toward us. I'm, we're getting about half your face. That's perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, Carlos Pellegrini, who is the uh, chair of surgery for many, many years at the University of Washington, Seattle, and was the first Latin American president of the American College of Surgeons, uh, actually became the president in 2013, which was the 100th year of the American College of Surgeons, which was founded in 1913. In this presidential address, he spoke about five values. And I never forgot those. I was in the audience at that time. So next slide, please. So in his mind, the five values that he was, and he's giving this talk to the new initiates into the American College of Surgeons as fellows. After all their training, medical school, residency, fellowship, whatever, board certification, and this was his talk to them. Professionalism, excellence, innovation, introspection, and inclusion. And I don't think I need to say any more about those five points because if ever, if ever they were relevant, certainly the last one in today's world of the need for diversity and anti-racism inclusion. And on the top, professionalism. And unfortunately, you're gonna see, as you enter into the profession, you're gonna see some people that don't act in a professional way, and yet there they are. And you need to, you may not be able to do anything about it, but you need to register it to make sure that that's not somebody that you want to emulate. You know, Richard, I, uh, yeah. in, trying, in trying to think about the professionalism and the excellence piece, I've, I've reflected over the many years, the 40 plus years I've been doing this, only you as a doctor can hold yourself accountable to a standard of care. And I've said, I'm going to use the word, but, so y'all please forgive. The butt I kicked the hardest in my career is my own when I've been wrong about something, uh, you know, and so I've taken the position with training now. And now that I'm in a training program, I said, 
you can't accept the fact that you're going to be wrong. Now, you're going to be wrong, but, you know, as much as you can, do not allow that. That's hard to teach, but people have to learn it themselves. Well, well said, Ray. Well said. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, in my theme of trying to make this apparent to you all, which I hope I'm being successful at. So, quote, if you want to make enemies, try to change something. <laughs> and... Obviously, that's been said by many people, but Woodrow Wilson actually was quoted as having said that. And what he meant by that is, you know, the importance of doing what is right, even when it's against the status quo. And he's known for many, many things, but, you know, he fought so hard for the League of Nations, which he couldn't get across. So if you think that in your career, when you see things that are not right, whether there are physicians not doing the right thing, whether there are departments not doing the right thing, obviously it's a fine line between being Don Quixote and screaming and yelling and going out because you've got to, but you can't just be silent. You've got to be able to go through proper channels, appropriateness, in the way that you deal with it, but you need to speak up as opposed to just looking the other way. Next. Hey, uh, Richard, we've been given a quote from someone that trained under Dr. Silen, who's with us tonight. <laughs> His name is Neil. And he sent us this quote. He said, the radiologist perceives a shadow, sees a lesion, and imagines the man. The bedside physician sees the man, perceives the signs, and imagines the lesion. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd enjoy that. I heard that one, too. And, and In fact, I don't, I don't know that person, but please feel free to contact me. Um, <laughs> when we got there, just as an aside, the first week we were there, we were given this manual. It was called a survival manual. And it was a survival manual, how to survive Dr. Silen. And it was about a 14 or 15 page typewritten single, single space, single side document about every single thing he did it and how you were supposed to do it. And the way that came about was I got there in 1971, and about three years before me, there was a obviously well-trained, excellent candidate that came, I think from Stanford or whatever. But if Dr. Silen said A, this guy said B. And it was just this, this oil and water relationship to the point where finally he had enough. And rather than dismiss him he put him in the lab in his laboratory and he was a gastric physiologist but one of the chores in addition to doing research was to come up with a manual so that nobody would ever make the mistakes that this guy made i still have the original manual i got and uh, i won't bore anybody with it but if this neil on there ever wants to talk to me about it we can talk about it but any of it richard i would i would love a copy of that okay and uh, love it. i'm going to send you a I'm going to send you a letter and I have a book for you. So uh, please okay. keep going. Please. Um, I can't tell you how much I'm enjoying this. I hope this, everybody else is, but for me personally, I'm, I'm having the time of my life. So Neil, there are over 700 people hanging on every word. Please keep okay. going. And the okay. chat right now says, we okay. love it. Please, <laughs> one of them says, please, please bore us. <laughs> okay. All right. Be careful what you wish for. But in any event. Oh, keep going, man. So, we got all night. Everyone's heard, everyone's heard of the Mayo Clinic. And Charles and William Mayo, the brothers who started this thing in the middle of a cornfield in Rochester, Minnesota. <clears throat> and they said, quote, having a person's life in your hands is an awesome responsibility. And I would only say to all of you neophytes, don't ever, ever, 
ever forget that. No matter how difficult the situation is, no matter how disgruntled you may be, no matter, <coughs> no matter how frustrated you may be, no matter how beaten down you may be, don't ever forget that, that having a person's life in your hands is an awesome responsibility. Next slide, please. So the last slide in this segment is the qualities of a successful surgeon. In around 1996, in the archives of surgery at that time, there was an, this little piece entitled The Quality of Sexual Surgeon. And it was written by John Morton, who was professor of surgery at Strong Memorial Hospital, Rochester. And he wrote this saying he was asked to speak at the funeral service of a very close friend who happened to be a surgeon. And in preparing the remarks, he began to think of the characteristics of what this man represented. And he came up with these 10 things. So I looked at this and I said to myself, you know, I think I have a few of these things. Now, call it uh, presumptuous of me to think that, but but any event, some are just intuitive, a warm personality. You know, you need to be a person, you can't come there holy and thou standing there in your starched white coat and speaking down to people as if they're slaves. You need to be a human being. Obviously intelligence is a no brainer, an ethical approach. And, you know, it should be obviously a no brainer that you should always be doing things ethically, but when you get caught in the conundrum of what the insurance company wants or what the hospital wants or what the, or what the um, purchasing person wants in the operating room as to which equipment you may have, you need to be able to speak up and, and do the right thing. Humility, and that's really important. I mean, if I'm being operated upon, I want my surgeon to be humble. Now, that doesn't mean I want him or her to be so timid that he or she can't think about, oh, my God, what am I going to do? But I want him or her to be humble enough and have enough self-confidence that if you're faced with a situation in the operating room, or as a non-surgeon with a difficult diagnosis, and you don't, you're not sure to be able to reach out and ask for help, even if it's from a competitor, that may be someone that may be more knowledgeable than you. And that's very, very important. And I'm proud to say that I've done that on occasion. Now, you don't want to do it every single operation, or they're going to carry you away saying you need to go back to public school, but I have not hesitated. Much to the dismay of the nurses in the operating room who are hoping to go for their lunch break or whatever, to call out to a colleague and he had to get there and wait and whatever to ask him what he thought. And when he finished, he didn't say anything different than I thought, but I felt better. And then just about courage and and courage of your convictions. So you don't want a surgeon or a physician. You want someone that's confident, that's somebody that is confident, but there's a fine line between being confident and cocky. And that's true in many things. If you're flying in a plane I want my pilot to be confident, but I don't want him or her to be cocky to the point where, yeah, it's foggy or whatever, but I can do this. And the next thing you know, it crashes into a mountain. So, and self-analysis, and that is gonna be part of you from the day you start to the day you finish. That just like Dr. Fowler said about his butt, if you will, 
you got to be able to be self analytical, self critical. I mean, you can't beat yourself up to the point where you can't function, but you certainly just can't say next case and move on like nothing ever happened. Next slide, please. So I guess in the scheme of things, there's going to be a Q and A. So, um, let me just do one other thing, if it's okay, Reagan and, and Ray. Before, I would just like to, um, is the next slides the articles that I have? Uh, no, so the next slides will be the case studies and oh, okay. after the case studies are the articles. Okay, then fine. Then this is a perfect time. So I'm all yours. Okay. Um, first off, I just wanna say thank you. All of our students are absolutely loving you and they said that you should make like a podcast or your own youtube channel or something they love you okay well um, i'll let you do that reagan <laughs> all right that'll be our next project we can do it together um, richard we'll build you a website if you would like <laughs> i'm all yours go for it all right so um let's see you mentioned that none of your family members were physicians or in the healthcare field. So how did that impact your decision to go to medical school? <laughs> okay, can you see me? I can't see you all because the slides are up. But you I can, can see, see me, you. yes? Uh -huh. Can you see behind me, there's some instruments? Yes, we see a drum set. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was growing up in my teens, that was the farthest thing in the world that I thought I would be a doctor. Um, I didn't even like science. I mean, I, I guess I was smart and I did well in school and I was in the, the, the good homeroom and all that, but you know, that wasn't my thing. Um, actually, I wanted to quit school and go on tour with my band at that time around 1961 or 62. We had made records and uh, we actually were on the top 40, believe it or not. And um, Ray will know this because he's old enough, but uh, my band played with Benny King, which made the song Stand By Me, which is one of the classics in rock and roll. And I actually played one evening with Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. So um, that's what I thought I wanted to do, but my parents didn't want that. And actually, I, I was very talented in art, unbeknownst to me, but my mother saw that and I got shipped off to art school when I was a kid and I hated it because all my friends were playing ball and I had to go to art school and this and that and the other thing. But I actually went to school thinking I was going to be, okay, I'll combine art and math and I'd be from like the fountainhead Howard Rock and be an architect. And for whatever the reason, when I got there the day of the first day of school to register, I registered pre-med. And um, I've had a lot of soul searching over 60 years about this or 50 years, but I think the reason was two things. One, my grandmother, who I was very, very close with was dying from cancer and was living in my home. And again, I'm thinking this, I, you know, I, I don't have the, the psychoanalytical answer to whether I'm right or wrong, but I'm thinking that that had a thing to do with it. And <laughs> I'm not sure I should say this or not, but um, I was kind of like uh, a little ahead of my times growing up in the late 50s. And I remember my mother being called in to my seventh grade homeroom teacher, who I still remember to this day, may she rest in peace, Adele Apfel, who was a wonderful lady who liked me. And my mother came in perplexed about what to quote, do with me, because I was kind of out there. And I'm not talking about drugs or any of that stuff because it was before all that. But I was just out there. And she said to my mother, Ruth, you got to ease up on him. <laughs> He's a Palomino. You can't lock him up 
as a stable horse. You got to let him run. <laughs> I don't know. I don't I can't believe I'm even sharing this with you, but um, because I was a little out there, if you will, kind of like Ferris Bueller, those of you that remember Ferris Bueller's day off, you know, uh, the truant officer came a few times to my house. When my parents weren't home. I mean, I was just a, a non-criminal, non-violent, uh, mischievous, wise guy kid. I guess that's how I'll summarize myself. <laughs> um, so because of that, and my father particularly was very, very strict. Um, all I ever heard kind of was that I wasn't going to amount to anything and that, you know, and I'll leave it at that. Richard, so I'm holding in my hand, <laughs> in my left hand, I've got, I don't know if you can see it when I'm speaking, but I can't see anything except these. Two. Oh, okay. Well, that's fine. I'm, I'm holding the, the, the 1925 edition of Zachary Coke, the third <laughs> edition. In my other hand, I'm holding... I don't know if you know this. Did you know that Zachary Cope took the early diagnosis of the acute abdomen and put it to rhyme called the acute abdomen in rhyme? No, I did and, not know that. And it was by Zeta for Zachary Cope. And I, I'm holding that book in my hand from the 1920s. So wow. I'm going to see if I can find you a copy of that. Okay, I'd love it. Well, in any event, to, to finish my Freudian analysis of myself, I think deep down, so... I happen to be Jewish, so I think had my parents really had their wish, instead of me being a rock and roll star or whatever, and this and that, or, you know, they, what does every Jewish mother and father want? And my son, the doctor, they never said that. But so subconsciously, I registered pre-med and the rest is history. So that's the answer to how that happened. Wow, that is crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't recommend that as the path. That's definitely the path less traveled. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> so how do you think that the field of surgery will change in the next decade? Yeah, well, there is no question. I mean, as you saw what just happened in my, you know, in the since 2000, First of all, there's going to be less and less surgery, and that's happening in every disease process. I mean, operations that I learned and did hundreds of as a resident in training no longer exist because of, like ulcer disease is the case in point, and Dr. Fowler can relate to this. I mean, the one of the most common diseases that you saw as a medical resident or a surgical resident was upper GI bleeding from ulcer disease. Well, that has essentially disappeared from the face of the earth because of, you know, Prilosec and, and, and Zantac and what have you. I mean, so I don't care if you're the busiest surgeon in the world, you're lucky if you do maybe three or four benign non-malignant gastric operations in a year. And because- Like of, in the old days, you would chop out uh, the stomach with the Bill Roth procedures. That's right. And most of them to the duodenum or to the jejunum, B1, B2. That's and right. you don't see it anymore because you can get all the stuff over the counters. And, you know, Zantac was a prescription when it first came out, wasn't it? Yeah. Now it's over the counter. Yeah. And the sad thing is though, that there's always going to be an occasional patient who needs those kind of operations. And I'm sad to say that in both GI surgery or oncologic surgery and vascular surgery, that <laughs> the people that can do those operations like me are either gone or retired or retiring and I'm ashamed to tell you, and I'm very involved in the leadership of the Society of Vascular Surgery, that, and this is, this is astounding, that when you finish a two-year vascular surgical fellowship, I don't mean the integrated one, I mean 
five general surgery and two vascular surgery. The average graduating fellow does maybe two at the most, maybe three open aneurysms. And yet he or she is now being certified to be the expert. I mean, there's something wrong with that. So I can only tell you that to answer your question, I think as more and more progress comes about uh, between genomics and, and precision medicine, that I think there's gonna be less and less, and there's always gonna be trauma, unfortunately. There's always gonna be certain entities. Appendicitis is never gonna go away. But I think that the volume of operative surgery is gonna become less and less, and it's gonna to continue to become more and more minimally invasive with nanotechnology and whatever. You, you and I started long before um... Uh, uh, there were, you know, automatic restraints inside a car. No. First there were seat belts, then there were airba airbags. We had a horrible case this week that we saw of a 16 year old that was in the back and didn't wear his seat belt in a major mm -hmm. car wreck. And, you know, the seat belt would have saved his life. Instead, he went from the back of the car all the way through the windshield. And so there's always going to be folks that uh, are, right. are injured or ill yeah. because of, yeah. their own their own doing but you know just to just to uh amplify this last question to all of the students in the audience and this is no longer as focused on surgery when people ask me when particularly uh, medical students who are thinking about what they want to go into as a specialty and one thing that i tell people is take a look at the specialty and try to take a look and see what is, in other words, because you get turned on by being a vascular surgeon, if you will. And for those that grew up in the Houston era with Dr. DeBakey and Cooley and all those people, well, vascular surgery today is not what they did. 90 plus percent of vascular surgery is probably being an interventional radiologist. It's not operative open surgery. So if you were driven and turned on by big incisions and doing operative surgery, that's not what you're gonna be doing. And, and so you need to look at the specialties if you can and see, is that gonna be here 15, 20, 30 years from now? Now, certain things will be. Transplantation will be there. And there will always be open surgery and big incisions and sewing, but not every, not every, and look at cardiac surgery, the, the amount of numbers that have gone down astronomically since stents and angioplasty and statins and what have you. So you gotta, if you're looking at the big picture, what am I gonna do for the next 40 years? In whatever psychiatry will always be there, um, you need, Pathology will be there, but you need to look and see, is what I like today when I'm a third year medical student going to be what I'm going to be doing when I'm 50 years old? Next question. Um, I think we're going to keep going. We'll do more questions at the very end. Does that okay. sound good to you? Yeah. And I need to speed up so I don't keep you here till midnight. <laughs> no worries. Rachel, you can go to the next slide. Okay. Okay. So Reagan asked me... Um, to do some case studies. And um, I thought about that at great length. And so here they are. So the first slide. So along the theme of what I've been trying to tell you all, my mentor, Dr. Sawin, there's no such thing as minor surgery, only minor surgeries. So this case is a 60 plus year old African-American male who presented to my office with a quote, lump in the neck. Pretty mundane, routine, 15 minute, bing, bam, boom thing. Okay, so let me 
let me give you the history. And I'm going to, even though I could do it by heart, it'll be easier if I just read it. <clears throat> Jay-Z is a 60-plus-year-old African-American male who presented my office on a clinic day, booked in the appointment book as, quote, a patient with a lump in the neck. And in those days, after I no longer had to take mandatory emergency room call, I made my life a little simpler. I operated three days a week, and I was in the office two days a week, so that when I was in the office, that's all I did was see patients all day, pre-op, post-op, whatever. And when I was in the operating room, I didn't have to worry about rushing back to the office, barring an emergency. So when I walked into the examining room, the patient was sitting on the exam table facing me with a gown on. When I introduced myself to him, I asked where the lump is, at which point he turned around and showed me, next slide. <laughs> this quote, lump in the neck. By the way, this is the real deal. This is not fake. He showed me this huge mass. To say that I almost fell off my stool would be an understatement as I was certainly not expecting anything like this, nor for that matter in my many years of practice hadn't ever seen anyone present like this. In trying to not appear shocked and certainly not in any way wanting to make the patient feel foolish, inadequate, or embarrassed, I asked him how long he had this. And secondly, why he had not had this removed previously. He told me that he first noticed this as a quote, small lump, maybe 10 years ago. And when he had shown it to his, quote, doctors, end quote, and I'll leave that at there, he was told, leave it alone because it's not bothering you and it's nothing. <laughs> you should have gone back to those doctors now. Over the years, this continued to enlarge. And every time a medical person saw it, he was always told that if it wasn't bothering him, leave it alone. <laughs> well, it wasn't bothering the doctors, but you can imagine it must have been bothering him. This continued to grow and grow. And by the time, by this time, he became convinced that there was nothing more that could be done and that he would just have to live with it and accept the consequences. He, of course, was concerned and anxious, worrying what it could be, because it kept growing. Finally, just before seeing me, somebody referred him to me, I think because I took Medicaid, believe it or not, which most people in my community didn't take. And I will tell you that uh, for what Medicaid reimburses you for an operation, it's not worth the stamps and the paper to send the bill. And the reason I took Medicaid was I felt that it was my chance to give back to the community because they're entitled to medical care too. So I was one of the rare people that took Medicaid, which is how I think he came to me. So just before seeing me, somebody referred him to me, realizing that I probably took Medicaid, saying, that despite many other surgeons not wanting to deal with this, quote, Dr. Lin would take good care of him. I'll never forget, I had two medical students shadow me that day and they were absolutely beyond themselves when they saw this. I explained to the patient that I would operate upon him, pointing out that this was definitely not, quote, minor surgery and that it would take a few hours, but I was confident, especially after seeing the MRI, and that it was not impinging on the spinal canal, that I could accomplish this with a satisfactory result. It bothered me immensely that he had been tossed about and not helped over these years due to his insurance status and the, quote, uninteresting aspect quote, of the clinical problem, being told, don't worry about it. 
interestingly, he was also a Jehovah's Witness. And that's another whole separate issue, which we'll talk about later if we have time in one of the articles. And this was pretty large, as you can see. It was the size, literally, of a... Um, it was much bigger than the softball. Well, let's say cantaloupe, maybe, or even bigger. Can cantaloupe or honeydew was about the size of it, if you will. Correct. And so blood loss was certainly a possibility, but he was adamant about not wanting to have transfusion. And so I felt, okay, we'll do the best we could. The operation took three hours to complete with him in the prone position, meaning lying down with his neck down. And it was difficult for anesthesia because of his airway and he, his neck needed to be flexed so much to be able to allow to get to the top of that thing, if you will. Um, but at the conclusion of the operation, I was very pleased with the result. The same two medical students were in the operating room with me that day. And fortunately, this was totally a benign, non-malignant, giant, fatty lipoma with no malignant features, fortunately. He returned to the office for his first post-op visit and when the bandages and the drains were removed, he looked into the mirror and he started to cry. Next slide, please. On the final visit, with all the drains removed and the sutures removed, we hugged each other. The reason I'm presenting this seemingly, quote, non-exciting, comma, non-high-tech, case to you all is to point out that this man had unfortunately been passed around and the system failed him. For me personally, this was not an endovascular aortic aneurysm or a carotid endotorectomy or a liver resection case, but to him, it was the most important thing in his life that he had to live with for all these years. The sense of good feeling that I was privileged to experience having been given the privilege of caring for this man had no dollar value assigned to it. So that's the first case. Next slide, please. So the second case is about a carotid endotorectomy, but that's just what the operation was but it's really not about how to do a carotid, although I'll show you some pictures just to let you understand the anatomy. But it's about a book, quote, Doctors Cry Too, Essays from the Heart of a Physician that was written by Dr. Frank Bohm. Next slide, please. So this book, by Dr. Bohm, written in the late 90s, was written actually for the lay public. And it was, and, and uh, he also wrote a second book two or three years later about building patient doctor trust. Next slide, please. Frank Bohm, who I have met, um, was professor of obstetrics and gynecology and former director of high-risk maternal fetal medicine at Vanderbilt University and former chair of the ethics committee at Yale at um, Vanderbilt. And he wrote this book because that was around 1999 when the Institute of Medicine came out with the famous paper entitled To Air is Human, basically speaking about how hundreds of thousands of errors in medicine occurred in hospitals every year due to wrongdoing, if you will. And the perception of doctors was deteriorating rapidly. And the perceptions of doctors in his mind were 
that we only cared about money and we only cared about lifestyle and we didn't really care in that the days of Marcus Welby, if you go back to Mr. Rogers and all those people, the days of the compassionate doctor of the 50s and the Norman Rockwell paintings were gone. And he wanted to write this book to let the lay public know that that wasn't the case. And that doctors do cry and doctors are compassionate and what have you. And I met him and many years later in 2008, when I was the president of the Florida chapter of the American College of Surgeons, and for our four day symposium that I directed and organized with 300 in attendance, I had him come to speak to the surgeons about this. Any event, so here's the case. Next slide, please. So for those of you who may or may not know what a carotid endarterectomy is, the middle slide is the first slide. And if you see up in the top corner there, uh, you can see the patient's head turned to the side and an incision there along the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is the main muscle that, for those of you skinny, delineates your neck. And underneath that, a few layers down is where the carotid artery and the jugular vein uh, and the major structures are. And the carotid endarterectomy, what an endarterectomy means is basically to clean out the artery from, and you look here on, on, the, on the bottom here, the artery is filled with all this atheromatous cholesterol ridden plaque. And it looks like Swiss cheese and it's friable and what have you. And these pieces can break loose and little tiny pieces can break loose and go up from, I guess you can see me pointing, I guess, but because I can't see you all, but so this is the internal carotid and common carotid down here. And this is the common carotid. And then there's the internal carotid, which goes up to the brain and the external carotid that goes to your face. But this little debris can break loose and embolize up and go to the brain and cause a stroke. Sometimes it can be just what's called a TIA, which is a transit ischemic attack where a little tiny piece breaks off in the patient for a few minutes or an hour or a few hours, but under 24 hours has symptoms of maybe transient blindness or weakness on one side or whatever, or inability to speak, but then it clears away and goes away like nothing ever happened. But sometimes the very first episode can be a devastating, devastating, debilitating, even potentially life-threatening stroke. So this operation was first performed in, in the early 1950s. Dr. DeBakey claims he did the first one, but probably it was Eastcott and Rob who did the first one at, and, in, in, at uh, Guy's Hospital in London. But in any event, what you see here is the carotid artery in red. And just to make it real quick, you expose the artery, you isolate the artery, by clamping it here and here. And there's many different variations, but I just took this from an atlas. And then once, and then the patient is given blood thinner so that the rest of this doesn't clot. But for the time being, the blood's not going to the brain, although you can put a shunt in or whatever. And I'm not gonna get technical for this, but basically all this grumus in there is cleaned out. It's endarterectomized is the word. And then going over here, it's basically removed, and now you can see how fresh and clean the, the intima looks compared to all that junk. And then basically, when that's all done, the artery is closed up either with a patch or it's closed up primarily. And I'm, I'm, the purpose of this was not to go into the details, but I will tell you that it's a very intricate operation. It 
is, it was for many, many years and always was my favorite operation. And for 25 years of my 38 year career, it was always my favorite right up to the end. But for 25 years, it was the one I hated. So you might say, well, why did you hate it? Because you could do the most perfect operation technically you ever did in your whole life. And yet at the end, you had to sit there after you close the skin with your fingers crossed. <laughs> I'm being I'm joking, waiting till anesthesia woke up the patient because 95% of the cases were done around the world under general anesthesia to see if the patient woke up and moved everything and mentated and articulated appropriately as opposed to having had a stroke during the procedure. Through no fault of yours, that some little tiny piece of junk broke loose unbeknownst to you. And when the patient woke up, he was paralyzed on one side or whatever. And as I said to you, I couldn't stand that because for those of you who are golfers or those of you who are tennis players, if you hit a perfect drive, you knew, you know from the minute, first of all, you're not supposed to pick your head up anyhow. You know from the minute you hit that driver, if you hit the perfect drive, that ball is going to wind up within five feet, give or take, in the middle of the fairway. You don't have to worry that it's going to be, you know, 20 yards into the rough somewhere. So if you've done the most perfect, meticulous operation that you've ever done in your life and couldn't be reduplicated by Dr. DeBakey, Cooley, you name it, why should you have to sit there with your fingers crossed to see? But that's the inherent nature of the procedure because in the best of hands, the incidence of having a stroke on the operating table was somewhere between two and 4% and higher in symptomatic high-risk patients. So after 25 years of doing it under general anesthesia, like everybody else did in my community, and most people did, I was talked into by a respected colleague of mine, anesthesiologist one day, why don't, why don't you try this under local anesthesia with the patient awake? And I will tell you that surgeons are by and large superstitious. I wore the same operating shoes until they had to be carried out by human resources because they were in infectious vehicles, if you will, but I, I didn't want to change. But I trusted him and I did it that day, the patient awake. So if I was operating on the left carotid, which feeds the brain, but the right side of your body is where the brain relates to, you put a ball, like a, a rubber ball in his right hand, the patient's awake, and you can talk to him during the procedure and ask him to keep squeezing the ball. And as long as he's mentating like that, you know that everything's fine and you don't need to put a shunt in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So after that first day doing it that way, I never went back. Okay, fast forward to the case. So around 2005, I think it was, yeah. There was a man that came to, was admitted to the hospital having had repetitive strokes. They're called crescendo TIAs. He was having little repetitive strokes and he was worked up on the medical service and by neurology and everybody else and found to have this very, very high grade, severe blockage in his carotid artery. And it was the feeling of the neurologists and the medical people that he needed to have this cleaned out. And this was before carotid stenting or anything today. And I was known in the community as being the, without bragging, the, the carotid guy, if you will. I had already done close to seven or 800 of them with outstanding results. And I had the only accredited non-invasive vascular laboratory in all of 
three counties to be able to do studies or whatever. So I saw him. He was a man from Michigan, but was wintering in Palm Beach County out by Lake Okeechobee because he liked to fish. And a real nice man in his late 70s. And there was no question that I agreed with the consultants that he needed to be operated upon. So we made arrangements and I met with his wife and one of his daughters. And uh, this was before I switched to local anesthesia. In any event, we prepared him for surgery and he trusted me and he understood the risk that there was a potential chance of, besides other little things that could happen, numbness and bleeding and this and that, or dying, uh, you could have a stroke. Here you are trying to do the operation to prevent the devastating stroke. And yet, as a result of the operation, you could give him a devastating stroke. But he understood that. In any event, we did the procedure and it was as flawless and as, as I had ever done one. Another board certified vascular surgeon colleague, we always assisted each other, was there. Headlamp, loop magnification, everything pristine. And he woke up from the anesthetic and he was paralyzed on the opposite side and couldn't speak. To say that I was devastated was an understatement. I immediately, we went and reopened his neck to make sure that it, it hadn't thrombosed, but everything was wide open. And we arteriogrammed him and did everything, but there was nothing to do. Some little fleck of something, for the same reason that he had gotten the strokes before I ever touched him, for all it know, when we positioned his head and turned him sideways, maybe something broke off, it happened. To make a long story short, he was in the ICU for a week. He didn't die, but he made very little progress. So, yep, his wound was fine. The sutures came out, but he had to go to rehab and hope that he would make some improvement. But as the days went by, it was clear that this was not happening dramatically, if you will. The wife and the daughter, one of the daughters, <laughs> they worried more about me, I'm being facetious, because they saw how devastated I was and wanted to reassure me they were classic Midwestern lovely people to make them make me know that they didn't blame me. They knew I did my best, that it was in God's hands and blah, 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 blah. And eventually he went back to Michigan. So about a few months later, I was at the American Venus Forum meeting, which is the most prestigious Venus vascular symposium society of which I'm a member. And I was there during the reception. And this was about two months after, and I was still just, I couldn't get over it. And I was really debating whether I should stop doing carotid surgery, even though my stroke rate was only 0.8%, which is well below the national average of one to 3%. I had had four strokes in over 700 or 800 operations, but I just, it just, overwhelmed me and I felt maybe I need to stop, maybe it's me. Any event, Dr. Norman Rich, who was the chief of surgery forever at Walter Reed, one of the giants in American vascular surgery, did, and this is now 50 years later, compiled the Vietnam Registry of Vascular Surgery and was a giant in carotid surgery, was there as one of the faculty. And I did not know him other than to say, hello, sir. And he didn't know me. And I didn't train with him. But I was there and I went up to him during the cocktail reception. And I said, Dr. Dr. Rich, can I talk to you for a second? 
and he's a very he's an incredible man he's very he's almost it's hard to explain how uh, his demeanor is and i said dr rich i, I want to talk to you as if i was a parishioner and you were the priest so he, didn't, he must have thought i was nuts so he said well what is what are you talking about so we went over to a side table and i went on to tell him how demoralized I was and that I think I should stop doing carotid surgery. And he went on to ask me, and he wasn't flamboyant like Dr. DeBakey was or Cooley was. This was a, this was a unbelievable person, not that they weren't. And he proceeded to ask me how I did the procedure, what the indications were, why I did it, how I did it, how many I've done, what my training was. And when he was finished, he said, listen, you've got a long career ahead of you and you're as good as they come in their community and, and as good as they come anywhere. So you go back there, and you get back on the diving board. Doesn't mean you don't feel bad, but it's happened to me. And it may happen to you again. So I proceeded to continue. Well, about four months, I guess, later, one day, I get a letter in my office addressed to me, Dr. Richard Lynn, from a, a return address that I don't recognize and from a name I don't recognize. <clears throat> Next slide, please. I opened the letter, Dr. Lin, I just want to say that I never met you, but you took away something very precious to me. On February 20th, 2004, my father, Ted C, entrusted his life to you, but you performed a botched surgery and took away most of his world as he knew it. He was very excited about the surgery because he so feared having a major devastating stroke. This is his, her letter verbatim, if you will. After your surgery, he never walked or was able to tell his kids that he loved them again. He suffered for 10 months. We brought him home to Indiana. My mother took care of him as every need. My mom and my sisters and I had to do tasks for him that took away every bit of dignity he had left. Because even though he couldn't move, you could tell by his eyes that he still knew what was going on. On December 11th, his suffering ended, he passed away. Only you know what happened that day, but something went terribly wrong. Maybe it is time for you to retire and enjoy your family the way my dad will not be able to. Sincerely, Regina Blah. <laughs> if I could have taken- So Richard, uh, how, did, how did that make you feel? Well, I was just gonna say that if I could have slipped my wrists right then and there, I, 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 I was, I was hurt, I was, deeply saddened, especially after Dr. Richard kind of guided me through this. I you know, the problem in medicine, Richard, is that there's a bell curve associated with our treatments. And just, it's not a linear thing, it's a bell curve. And like it or not, there are going to be people in the bell curve, even if the tip of that curve is tiny. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. The, just the tip of the curve is tiny and there are going to be people here. You are at a 0.8% complication rate, which is astonishing. And sadly, and unfortunately, this poor gentleman uh, was part of that tip of the bell curve. What you can feel is the anger and the bitterness yeah. and, and, and the, the need, and the need the to blame somebody. Yeah. Well, and this lady, interestingly, I did not recognize the name because it wasn't the name of her father. And interestingly, 
she <laughs> wasn't there even after her father had the surgery. So she didn't come from Minnesota or wherever they were from, Indiana, to be there with their father. Her mother was there and her sister flew down to be there, but she didn't come and was not there the whole time, nor did she ever call me. So I was, I was bitter and I was hurt and I felt beaten up and I was demoralized. But okay. And I, I'm not, I wasn't nonchalant about it. I just felt, you know, this is her problem. But I felt I needed to try to explain to her, even though I didn't think she would give a damn, my side of the story. Next slide, please. So on January 22nd, 2005, I wrote a letter to this lady with a return address from the envelope. Dear Mrs. Blah, I received your letter and needless to say was deeply troubled by the content. First and foremost, I'm very sorry that your father, Ted C, has passed away. And I can assure you, despite never having met you, that your mother and your sister knew that I did everything possible during the operation. Immediately after the operation and daily in my devotion to your father's care. I can understand your sense of loss, and I am quite lucky to still have both my mother and father at age 85 who are with me. Little did I know my mother would die six months later. I dread the day that they are gone. As I hope you know, your father was operated upon because of a critical carotid lesion and having had a previous stroke. The situation was of urgency, and I can tell you that I have the reputation and I've continued to maintain it, that every possible attention to detail is always covered. This includes preoperatively before the surgery, intraoperatively, and obviously during the surgery and postoperatively. There was no question but that your father needed the procedure. I can tell you that having performed at that time over 700 carotid endotherectomies diligently, I have had a total of four strokes, your father having been the last. That is well below the national average in the best centers in the world, but it's not zero. For someone such as your father's situation with the risk of stroke was anywhere between one and five to six percent, because as you remember, he was having repetitive little mini strokes in anyone's hands at any university. It is unfortunately inherent in the basic process and despite perfect technique, and despite all attention to detail with magnifying loops, headlamps, two board certified vascular surgeons at the operating table and an experienced team with anesthesia, these rare but devastating events occur. Obviously they occur even before the operation even has happened, such as what happened with your father. If I had his operation to do over again, I can honestly tell you that critically looking at it, things would have been done the exact same way. Talk about self-assessment and introspection. Strokes occur whether the patient is done under general anesthesia or whether the patient is done under a weight cervical block, whether one uses a patch or a shunt or does not. Approximately one month after your father's event, I was at the American Venus Forum, and I won't belittle it because I told her what I just told you about when I spoke to him. He counseled me that, that to the fact that this is unfortunate, the nature of the specialty and the nature of the procedure. It is no different than a plane crash, he said. If one flies on an airline and wants a guarantee from the airline that the plane will not crash, there is no airline in the world that will sell you a ticket. Yet we all take the plane and hope for the best and thank God we are all still here, but not everyone is, i.e. 9-11. And we have all read about the unfortunate, total, gentle, non-harmful people who perish, not perish, for no explainable reason. I know from my conversations with your sister <clears throat> that she understood, and your mother, that she understood my compassion and my dedication to your father. 
I would recommend that you read a book entitled Doctors Cry Two: Essays from the Heart of a Physician by Dr. Frank Bohm. It's a book that I have read, and in fact, I've met Dr. Bohm, and it shows in the unique way that doctors are subject to the same stresses and pressures in life as everyone else, and that physicians suffer equally as much as patients' families. There's never a night that goes by that when the phone rings at 2, 3, or 4 a.m. from the ICU, that all of the potential possibilities of problems go through my mind, and I immediately, I have to deal with it. I was very fond of your father and mother and felt privileged if they came all the way from Lake Okeechobee to be cared by me. I can only tell you that I did my best and I believe that that is all one can do. I'm deeply sorry for your feelings and I'm confident that had you been at the hospital and met me, perhaps your feelings would have been different from the standpoint of compassion caring and reputation heard from the professionals within the hospital with whom I work. I am not in any way trying to brag or boast, but to try in some way to let you know that I too have a heart and a conscience. And I am committed every single time that I'm given the privilege of caring for someone to carry out a procedure to the best of my ability. I was trained at Harvard by a perfectionist, i.e. Dr. Silen whose picture is staring at me at this moment in my office as I dictate this letter. And he never, ever took an operation, no matter how complex or minor, in a light way. He had a famous saying that there was no such thing as minor surgery, only minor surgeons. Obviously, carotid endarterectomy was not minor and is not minor, but on the other hand, just because one has done some 700 procedures, each one has to be as if it was your first with the same attention to detail. And I can assure you that this was the case with your father on that day. I hope that you will feel some degree of comfort from this letter and I hope that you share it with your mother and your sister. I'm available to you at any time should you need to speak to me further for further closure. And I wish you peace and continued fond memories of your father. As I stated at the beginning, I'm lucky at this moment in time that I still have my father. And for that, I'm deeply sorry for you, but your father is at peace. And in my conscience, I am hopeful that he looks favorably upon me. With deep respect and sorrow for your loss, I remain me. So you, one of my colleagues questioned why you I said that. You said a lot more than I think. You said a lot more than I, I don't know. You this is so pouring out from your heart, the grief that you felt, wanting to assure her of the professionalism involved. Yeah. What were you trying, what I, were you I, trying to tell her? Okay, well, first of all, I wasn't doing it to prevent a lawsuit, even though some of my colleagues thought that's why I was doing it. You your know, colleagues would have said, don't write this letter that it's too long. Most of my colleagues, most of whom I respect, and some dear friends all told me that I was stupid to have done this. Let it go. If you get sued, you get sued. And let it be. I, 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 looking back at it now, 15 years later, I am convinced I did not write it to try and obviate a lawsuit. It strikes I, me that you wrote it because you were hurting in your own heart. I was. And you, and wanted, to, you're and right. you wanted to share that grief. Yeah, and what bothered me was that the patient's wife and one daughter didn't feel like this person did. But she, for whatever reason, lashed out at me as if, well, you heard what she said, I botched it, I was a butcher, and on and on and on and on. So I, I needed it to maybe put closure for myself that I, okay, you do what you want. I don't know who you are. I don't know if you even read it. Well, you know, Richard, if you were to take your letter and make it a lot shorter, it would be, why did we do it? Here is my skill. This is what we did. This is what the result was. Sadly, unfortunately, in a small number of cases, these results do happen. Uh, I also am sharing this grief and I wish it could have been better. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I'm proud to say that I 
graduated Phi Beta Kappa, but I can tell you that I am probably the worst example of run on sentences. And, <laughs> and so you're absolutely right. Brevity is not something that I ever learned. So this could have been condensed into three paragraphs, but in my inimitable style, for better or for worse, it was what it was. Okay. You know, I, one, of our, one of our questions, Ashley says, the lady who wrote wasn't there to get closure. So maybe this was her way of feeling guilty and she needed to express her grief. Okay. Well, here comes the finale. Next slide. Three years later, now, in 2008, three and a half years later from when I received that letter, I get a letter, again addressed to me, from again a name I don't remember, a meaning on the return address. Dear Dr. Lin, first I must say I apologize that I am just now sending you this letter. I should have sent it three years ago but I was grieving over the loss of my father and needed someone to blame. And unfortunately, you were the one I chose. I'm not sure you remember me or not, but my father, Ted C, had a stroke and died 10 months later after you performed carotid artery surgery on him. This time she didn't say botched surgery, but anyway. <laughs> I then wrote you a seething letter blaming you for my loss. I knew better to blame you and my dad would have been very disappointed in me for doing so, but unfortunately I did it anyway. I was going through some items in my desk today and I found the letter you sent to me in response to my letter. Why she never answered it at that time, I don't know, but I will tell you later. I really appreciate the time you took out of your busy life to send it to me. When I received your letter, it made me realize what a compassionate man you are and also that doctors also hurt when something happens to their patients. I was also pleased that you remembered my dad and he wasn't just a number, but that you were also devastated by what happened to him. My dad really looked up to you and I should have known that he would not have entrusted his life to someone who was not a kind and caring person as well as talented in his fields. So when I found the letter you sent me, I also felt a nudge by a wonderful angel that I needed to help you too find peace in all of this. So Dr. Lin, please accept my apology for the letter I sent to you. I was daddy's girl and was totally devastated by losing him. I just want you to know that I wish you nothing but peace and happiness in your life. Sincerely, Regina Blah. What a full circle. I, so when you asked me how I felt when I got that first letter, you can imagine how I felt when I got this. I, I cried, literally cried in my office. I mean, here I was just going through my mail. I mean, you know, and I, I it just everything went through me and and I had a busy office day that day, but I said, I got to deal with this. So, and so this was 2008 and it's before, I don't even think Google was around yet. I don't know, but somehow I called old fashioned information in where that address was, but her name. And I got a telephone number and I called her. Wow. That's courageous. And she answered the phone. And I said, is this Mrs. Whatever? She said, yes. I said, this is Dr. Lynn. I said, please don't hang up. <laughs> and I'm sorry. She, and she, she said. Did you really, you really said that? I did. And, <laughs> and I, because I wasn't sure, maybe she didn't really mean what she said, although it sounded real. And to make a long story short, because the hour is getting late, we spoke for one hour and she went on to tell me that she had been going through a lot of crap in her life at that time I think a divorce I don't know things were not going well for her and then on top of that she had guilt about not being there and all this and Florida doctors and 
and the rest was history. And we talked and we both wound up crying on the phone. And I thanked her from the bottom of my heart. And I went on to tell her about my family and my kids and my grandchildren at that time and what have you. She went on to tell me about her mom. And uh, that was the end of it. Um, and for whatever reason, I didn't throw any of this out. I saved it. And um, maybe I didn't know that this um, appeal from Reagan was going to happen <laughs> um, all these years later. But uh, Richard, were you, able, were you able to forgive her? Oh, by all means. And more importantly, I felt that she truly forgave me. Um, yeah, the answer was absolutely. Because she was human also. After all, she doesn't know me. You know, Florida, this, that, whatever. But I was glad that I did send the letter that I sent. And I was glad that it was as long and verbose as it was. Because as opposed to, well, you know, you have some nerve. This is the way I did it. I've done 700 of these. I'm board certified. I'm this, I'm that. How dare you? And, you know, that would have gotten nowhere. And, and I felt at the end, as I looked up from my desk, because Dr. Silent's picture was staring at me, that I did what he would have wanted me to do. And, um, and so the reason I present this to you all, the students, is Again, it's not about a carotid endotorectomy. What you're about, and you're all, before we all got on the call, I got the chat in the green room, I guess, like on, you know, Jimmy Kimmel with, the, with Reagan and Dr. Fowler and the staff of, who puts this together. We just talked about all sorts of little things. And three or four or five of you um, are waiting anxiously hopefully your acceptance to medical school. But I wanted to show throughout this evening, and I hope I was able to accomplish this, I hope, that again, this was not about me, and this is not about surgery, but this is about a, a life's commitment that you are gonna be undertaking and even though every and I was on the admissions committee of the medical school that I transitioned to for four years. So I read a lot of essays. And many people just write, I always want to do this and I want to be this and I want to work in a third world country and this and that. As they then four years later go into dermatology and ophthalmology and what have you. And suddenly they're not working in HIV clinics. But in any event, I the mere fact that you all are involved in this and have partaken in this, not because I'm on here, I'm just one of the lucky people that have been able to reach out to you all, that this is what you're embarking on and don't ever lose sight of it, no matter what specialty you choose. But like the Mayo brothers said, the awesome responsibility of having a patient's life in your hands or when you're in the emergency room, yeah, and maybe the, you know, the gomer, if you will, the one that keeps coming back with the same complaint, but you know what? This time he or she may have the real deal. And it's hard. And it's hard to be able to stay focused 24 seven. And it's hard to be idealistic 24 seven, but you've got to try. And I would encourage you, and I'll leave on this note that Seek out, you've already got these mentors right now on the phone with you, and I'm happy to include myself as one of them if you choose to allow me the privilege. But look for those people. You don't need a lot of them, but you need one or two that are going to be there that you can lean back on 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years later and know that you're doing it the way he or she would. And with that, um, 
there are, it's real late and there are articles at the bottom and I will, I'm not going to go into them. They were picked because they exemplify this theme again. And I'll just say the following about them and you, you can read them. And then again, if you want to reach out to me, you can talk about it. The first one, and this is apropos to you, uh, Dr. Fowler, about bedside teaching. So the first one was Dr. Silence, a paradigm change in training. He wrote this in 1987 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Now he was retired by then, but he saw, he saw a real change in what, how students and train, trainees were being trained. And they weren't being trained the way Dr. Fowler was or the way I was. It was, what's the CAT scan show? What's this? What's that? Boom, bam, boom, bop. As opposed to watching the preeminent physician at the bedside palpate an abdomen or listen to a heart murmur or listen to a karate brewery. And he gave, a, he gave an expose on how he thought training needed to go back to. And I'm sad to say it hasn't happened. And I think he knew it was never gonna happen because of finances and RVUs and everything else that don't allow that. And they weren't gonna get there at five in the morning so they could, so he could teach students, okay? The next one was um, morning on morning rounds. And it's about, again, this kind of thing about having a bad result in an intensive care unit ICU fellow mourning over this patient that had a code and whatever died. And you'll see, I think you'll appreciate it much more now that we've hopefully had this talk. The next one is from illness as a culture to caregiving. And it's a vignette, by the way, the Journal of the American Medical Association known as JAMA, which has been around now since well over a hundred years. There's a section that's been in there for well over the past 50 years entitled, um, um, what is a that? Piece it's, of My uh, Mind, A Piece of, of My Mind. mind. That's right. And, that's right. and it would be a little vignette, a page, page and a half by a doctor, or not even a doctor, it could be a healthcare provider about something. And many of these things came from that. And I've always, to this day, looked to that. Anyhow, this was about a person, a doctor, whose wife developed Alzheimer's. And he was no longer the doctor, but he was a caregiver. And it's different when you're on the other side of the fence. And then the next one is saying, listening to Leviticus. And it's about a surgeon about to operate on someone who's a Jehovah's Witness and that whole thing. And as you know, the, the people that believe and are Jehovah's Witnesses, the, their, their, the sine qua non of what they believe comes from the book of Leviticus about blood and all that. And then the last one was something I was very proud about and I wish we had more time, but it was published in the journal Surgery, which is a blue and white journal and probably the number two or three peer reviewed journal. And it was written by Andy Andrew Warshaw, who was the uh, chair of the Department of Surgery at the Mass General for 20 years and went on to become the president of the American College of Surgeons, but who knew me and knew about this thing that happened to me about Oliver Wendell Holmes and this gift I got. And uh, as I said, it's, you know, I mean, I could go all night, but it's 25 after 10. And so uh, read it. And then, as I said in the beginning, um, I meant what I said. I'm happy, you know, if I can't talk when you call or text, I'll get back to you. But I'm happy to be there 
to any of you that want to speak to me. So without any further ado, I'll leave it at that. Richard Lynn, what an amazing, amazing talk. <laughs> I'm on my second handkerchief. Everybody put a thank you, Dr. Lynn, into the chat, would you please? Richard, that was, if I have had a more moving moment, I, I don't know when it was. I, thank you for sharing the raw personal nature of that incredible story of you doing the best you could with your skill and your heart and, uh, and the events that occurred and how it resolved. It means so much to all of us. Um, we're going to post your email address with your permission on the website. So if folks can contact you. Yeah. And, and my phone number too. Well, if, if you want to do that, that's fine. I, I, I want to do it. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big boy. If it gets too much, I'll, be, <laughs> I'll be, change uh, your phone number. I'll, I'll <laughs> hang up the white, you know, handkerchief and, you know, surrender. All right. Richard, on behalf of the virtual shadowing team, we would like very much to extend an invitation for you to join us whenever your time is convenient to do, to do this. We've already had many, many, there's already still almost 500 students online saying, please uh, bring him back. So no. we would just like to invite you to be a part, as, as much of a part of this as you would like to be going, going down the road. So well, it would be my privilege and, and I thank you for vetting me and thinking that I would have something to offer. I hope I do. Uh, I'm turning to my side and seeing Dr. Silent's picture. And I only wish that he could have known what I was doing, but um, um, good luck to all of you and um, um, stay safe and God bless you all. Thank you. Have a great night. Reagan, would you give us the wrap up on the quest base? Sure thing. So the quiz is up. The pen oh, wait, Greg, can I just ask one question? Yeah, sure. Is it possible for me to ever see any of these um, comments or that's not possible? Uh, yeah, I have all the chat downloaded on my computer. So I'll save the good ones for you and send it. You, <laughs> you can send the bad ones. You can send them where. <laughs> there's, there's no bad ones. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so this is for quiz 36. The pen and password are right there. Um, make sure you take this quiz and pass it with a 70% or more. That is the only way that we can verify these hours for you. And we also give you a really pretty certificate. So make sure you download that and save it to your files. Um, it will be open until next Tuesday at 6.59 p.m. Central Time. And it will be posted to our website, our Instagram, our Slack. This recording will be posted to YouTube and we'll also send out a recap in the email tomorrow. On so YouTube, Dr. How, how does one see it on YouTube? I'll send you the link, Dr. Lynn. How about that? Okay, that's great. Okay. Perfect. Um, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Lynn. We would definitely want to have you back. We love you so much. All the students are <laughs> obsessed with you. So. Sure. Thank you. It was, I, I, I got more out of it than you did. Trust me. I don't know about that. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everyone. And thank you all for coming. Have a great evening. Good night. Thanks.